everyone, welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters, with your questers Josh and Dan. That guy is Josh. And that guy is Dan. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things trollical, part, I don't know, 87, 93, something like that. We're way up there in the listing. Uh, if you have any questions for us, please drop us a line at edsgpodgmail.com. We are in episode 170, kind of rounding out our troll Crystal Raiders culture here. Yeah. But before <laughs> that, we have a couple of emails. We do. Uh, I forgot. Hey, guys. This one's actually coming to us from Scott. Hey, guys. Continuing to love the podcast. I have been especially enjoying the episodes involving the horrors. Well, good, because they're going to wrap up here pretty soon. Unfortunately, it means I now need to invest in the horrors book as well. Foss is happy to take your cash. But I have a question with regards to Nemesis. Since Nemesis is willing to provide assistance to name givers in defeating other horrors... I was wondering how this horror might be involved with those on the horror stalker path. I could see those path members working with Nemesis, not only knowing, but willingly. I could even envision Nemesis being a form of patron passion of sorts for the horror stalkers. Okay, so maybe that's a, overstating things a bit, but the horror stalkers seem like a path that definitely follows the ends justify the means approach. And in that context, I could see Nemesis being a very necessary evil to them. I know you have both referenced source materials from previous editions in the past, and it hasn't seemed like too difficult a task to convert them to 4th edition use. However, it sounds like this may not be the case with movement rates from previous editions. This sounds like a large change from 1E to 4E, and I was wondering if you have some further explanation or conversion that might be easier. For example, could you consider the movement rates in 1st edition to be feet instead of yards? Any clarification is welcome. Again, thanks for all the good work. P.S. I was finally able to listen to the conclusion of the Zorg campaign on the Legends of Earthdawn podcast. Scott. Yes, uh, to address that last point first, those episodes are finally out. They've been dropping here the last couple of weeks as we are recording this. So that is the close of that major campaign focus from the Legends of Earthdawn podcast. I think the fight against Zorg like takes up two or almost maybe three full episodes. That was a that was a big major thing. Yeah, that was recorded like three years ago. That was recorded a while ago. I don't have my notes handy to pull up to check what the actual date was. But yeah, that was an experience. And there was a new episode that just recently dropped prior to or after Scott's email. And so I think... Cliff is maybe going to continue releasing all of the stuff that we recorded up to the end of sort of the next major thing. So it's it's apt to like I possibly have episodes releasing for a good while yet as Cliff finishes up what he needs to do to release each of them. Backtracking. Nemesis as a patron for horror stalkers. I don't think it's something that broadly would be accepted by them. I think the horror stalkers, particularly as presented the write-up for them in Mystic Paths, makes them, broadly speaking, a little bit too fanatical uh, as a broader organization to be willing to work with Nemesis. I could see individual horror stalkers possibly doing that, it potentially being a source of drama or interpersonal conflict between horror stalkers or maybe having a, a couple of different camps of them. I would be pretty inclined to think that perhaps, and I think we talked about this a little bit in passing, is that the Grim Legion would be an organization that is a little bit more likely to end up affiliated or taking advantage of the offers that Nemesis puts out. But again, the Grim Legion is not a massively organized group. There's a bunch of different sort of individual cells and companies and groups that kind of operate under that broader umbrella, and different ones may have different approaches fair. based on their Absolutely fair. philosophy and experience and that sort of thing. But it's certainly uh, an avenue that is rife for conflict or adventure or whatever when it comes to those horror fighting organizations 
As for the final thing with regards to movement rates, there isn't an easy conversion for movement rates that I could just offer as a across the board thing. Movement rates were scaled back for a couple of different reasons. One is that the movement rates were just so high, especially for high dexterity characters in first edition and second and classic as well. And then scaled back a little bit. And then the combat rounds were made shorter, uh, six seconds instead of 10 seconds in the later editions, which would then cut movement rates back even farther. I think probably what I would be inclined to do would be to just kind of make a rough comparison from movement rates of a horror or any other creature from first edition compared to the the second uh, to the fourth edition movement rates just get a rough approximation of what the reduction multiplier is yeah like what the ratio is you would look at for example the movement rate for crojan right which is a creature that has both first edition and fourth edition stats look at what the movement rate difference ends up being for that and do something yeah kind of similar in terms of converting over the movement rates for horrors or anything else that you are otherwise updating to fourth edition I know that Morgan has actually done work on updating all of the stat blocks for the named horrors. Uh, they have not found a place in a book yet. Hmm. You know, those those stat blocks may be made available at some point or not, depending. Uh, I don't know. All that aside, yeah, just look at the at the ratio of first edition movement rates to fourth edition movement rates for creatures that are in both already and do a, a a rough approximation for converting the movement rates for horrors or other creatures that you're adapting yeah i don't know that there's actually a formula that morgan has for doing those conversions but that's the way i would approach it yeah that's that's easy to cobble together <laughs> or you could do the even easier thing which is just make something up absolutely off the cuff work with me here uh okay auto one from pierre luke Hello, friends. I am currently Game Master in 4th edition on a camp I wrote back in the 90s when I was in high school, and we are having a blast. Still my favorite tabletop after all these years. I have three players, two of which were in my campaign back in 97 to 2001, enjoying the new rules and the fact that my first-gen books are still relevant. I'm only missing three physical copies of the original first-gen stuff. I am wondering if you guys have a website where I can find the official timeline with important events or maybe an episode of the podcast where you go through the years with everything happening canonically. Also, this interactive map is the best one I could find online. He has a link. The website is French. Not a problem for my Canadian ass, but the map has English interactive points. I would love to see an official product from you guys. Cheers. P.S. Is there any plan to print the fourth edition books in standard letter format? The PDF is fine, but sometimes having a good old rule book in my hands is just better, and I dislike the pocket-sized ones available now. Pierre Luke. Again, we'll kind of take these in reverse order. There are not any plans currently to do <laughs> a 8.5 by 11 or letter size or standard size, quote-unquote, books for 4th edition. That is something that comes up periodically, but the layout and form factor of the fourth edition books is something that at this point has been pretty well locked in and is not going to be something that changes in any way. That's just the, the decision that we've made. But what you can do is take your PDF to FedEx Kinko's and print it out in eight and a half by 11. Print it for you. Or your Canadian equivalent thereof. Exactly. That's one possibility. I'm aware of the interactive map. It's from uh, Fondation Draco. It's uh, Julian, Julian Peru. He did a, a French language Earth on actual play show. He's done a bunch of other stuff with RPGs and, and whatnot. He's actually the primary writer on the Arancia mm. book that is in development right now. So that's something that, that he has been involved with. Yeah, I'm I'm aware of that. That's something that's been around for a while. As far as an official product, 
for something like that. That sort of development cycles kind of thing. And there's already Julian's Atlas, which is pretty good. Let's see. What was the other thing? Oh, timeline. Yes. Okay. The timeline. There are, in fact, four episodes of this podcast where we go through the timeline from the fourth edition books in terms of just kind of going through the overall history. The one that you might be most interested in when it comes to... Yeah, the furthering of the timeline. Things that are different from first edition or from, from earlier editions is the fourth episode of that where we talk about the, the time skip and the fourth edition and whatnot. We don't necessarily go like year by year on that. There is a timeline that is in the fourth edition book in the fourth edition GM's guide. The history chapter has little excerpts that are sort of timeline-esque in terms of talking about the years of stuff. There was, and I don't remember now whether I have updated it on my site. I did back in the first edition days, went through like every source book and cobbled together a timeline of like everything that was, had a date associated with it in the various history chapters of the different books. And that was sort of the source of where the timeline that is in the third edition books and fourth edition uh, sort of originated. And if it's not on my website at loremerchant.com, I'm pretty sure that there are versions of it uh, that are that are elsewhere on the internet. Um, search for Earth Dawn Timeline, and I think you will find it. I don't know whether any of those have included any of the fourth edition updates. I know I didn't in my original one, but. Yeah, those are the the closest resources for that sort of thing uh, that you are likely to find. Fair. Okay, thank you, listeners, emailers. We'll have more for you. If we get more emails, uh, please send them to edsgpodcast at gmail.com. For the rest of the episode, we're going to talk about what it's like to live in Crystal Raider society. So to that end, uh, my favorite part in the entire Crystal Raiders book is The Legend of Living Crystal. Do you know this one, Josh? Not off the top of my head, no. Fair. In Troll Legend, Living Crystal comes from the tears of the spirit of all things who birthed all name givers, tears she shed because of her loneliness, and then in her joy at the creation of the trolls and obsidimon, her true children. Her tears fell to the earth and seeped into the stone of the mountains, becoming as hard as stone themselves. Because the spirit of all things wept these tears for the trolls, the Crystal Raiders considered Living Crystal to be part of their birthright. The Crystal Raiders have a saying, We wear the tears of our mother to honor her. Na'ul wear the crystal only by making their mother weep. A who sees another name giver wearing or carrying an item of living crystal always takes the time to learn how that person came to possess such an item, for they consider the use of all living crystal to be a matter of katera. They rarely believe other name givers to be worthy of owning or using living crystal. That's cool. I also am not super the amount to which you should use that in your game should depend on what clans or what moots the trolls are from and how much of a pain in the ass you want it to be for your <laughs> player characters. Yeah, that's the sort of thing that could very easily be turned into a yeah <laughs> could go sideways could very easily be turned into a cudgel um especially if you've got a player who is decided to play a highland troll mm -hmm. sky raider or a a troll that very strongly adheres to that and could end up being a source of conflict within the group that you want to make sure is okay and that isn't taken too far Agreed. So the part of it that I have the issue with is Crystal Raiders don't believe that other name givers are worthy of wearing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the part where they try and find out how they came by it and perhaps what they have been doing with it to make sure that they are honoring the beliefs and, and whatnot. Yeah. Turning it into another version of Obsidian Skin Armor where it's something that is going to automatically antagonize a significant portion of the, you know, a, a notable portion of a culture. Population. Is a potential problem. <laughs> so just be aware of that 
in terms of how you choose to handle that in your game. Like I said, I, I love the writing of it. I like the idea. It's a fantastic legend and one of the more create better creation myths of at least crystal living crystal. I, I agree that it shouldn't be used as a cudgel and it's just one of those don't ostracize people with it and you treat it better than that. And all Josh's points are salient and wonderful, wonderfully made better than I could have done so myself. So if you're going to be in and around where the crystal raiders are, obviously it's going to be in the mountains. So this is about mountain travel a little bit getting into and or through or over the Twilight Peaks is kind of a difficult uh, journey to be made under the best of circumstances. Uh, here's a, a small short list of all the things that could possibly get in your way. Crystal Raiders, dangerous creatures, there's barren terrain, uh, and it's, it's really difficult there to forage for any kind of food. So basically, the safest, air quotes, safest route to get in to the Twilight Peaks is to take the Western Pass. Getting into it from the north or the south or the east is like nigh impossible. Not to be recommended. And we talked about the Western Pass when we discussed the Blood Lords and the Black Fangs, because those are the clan, those are the moots that are closest to it. And there's more or less like one or two small passes in the west that head up into the Great Sword Valley. And those are all watched fairly closely. So you either need to be exceptionally skilled to avoid notice or be <laughs> aware that you are going to need to deal with uh, probably the, the more ornery <laughs> clans that you're yeah. likely to run into in the Twilight Peaks. Of course, that's if you are traveling on foot. If you are able to procure the services of an airship, Getting into the Twilight Peaks area, while still difficult because of the need to navigate the treacherous peaks and the winds and everything that are around there, becomes a little bit easier. And you don't necessarily have to pass through hostile terrain or hostile territory to get to the area that you're trying to get to. Yeah. But if you are traveling by airship, prepare to be raided. Yes. Because <laughs> that's their specialty. And, you know, I can't say they take lightly to being uh, airily intruded upon. I'm not entirely sure how to phrase that. Anyway, uh, aerially. aside from that, aerially, thank you. Uh, if they are, if you are traveling by foot, be aware that mountainous travel is hazardous travel due to sheer drops, narrow ledges, and high cliffs. This is otherwise known as the best home field advantage for all of the troll moots. And that's why, and that's saying that what's even mildly traversable is likely to be trap laden. So if you're on foot... Good luck, because you're going to need it. Yeah. And any area that is likely to be traversable on foot is likely to be not only trap laden, but possibly watched or settled in some capacity because, you know, not everything in the Crystal Raider society is done from airship. Only so many airships and a lot more trolls. So, you know, there would be a lot of centuries other trolls that yeah any area that is capable of having name givers traverse it is likely to have name givers <laughs> traversing it in some capacity unless it is ridiculously remote from any kind of civilization probably the easiest foot travel would be rather than yeah scaling any of the peaks would be traveling through the great sword valley yes but that is also an area that is apt to see quite a bit of attention and travel and whatnot. But haha, -ha, you say. But haha, -ha, you say. That <laughs> not just the trolls and crystal raiders that you are likely to run into. There are also yeah. the wildlife. There are the animals and creatures that live in the Twilight Peaks as well, who exactly. are just as well adapted to surviving in those harsh conditions as the trolls themselves are, in a way. And so even if you are able to obtain safe passage in some regard from the trolls, you are still likely to run into things like stone lions and brithens and elemental spirits of various sorts and possibly in some of the darker corners, uh, broken shelters or the horrors or undead that might uh, result from them and plenty of other things as well. 
The Twilight Peaks aren't particularly known for infestation. That's not a great word. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure they wouldn't like me putting it that way. Dragons and uh, Draco forms like wyverns and such are not particularly populous within the Twilight Peaks. But, you know, you would still potentially run into things like that. You're there are no there is no great dragon, for example, that claims the Twilight Peaks as their lair. But it is certainly possible that you might have uh, younger adult dragons or fair wyverns or other sort of lesser Draco forms like that to contend with. Yeah, there's a lot of nasty stuff that you could potentially run into uh, in the course of expeditions, especially given how difficult foraging and survival can be. They are likely to find uh, name givers a tempting target. But haha, you say, I'm not going to go over land and I'm not going to come in by airship. I'm going to take the river. And so this is if you want to get in higher elevations. You have to know that if you're going to take a boat, you're going to be going against the current upstream. And then you have to be aware of white water, rapids, waterfalls, and flash floods in the melting season. And then if all else fails, there's also rock slides, mud slides, and avalanches of snow in the higher elevations. Just for those game masters who want to be particularly the cruel. Yeah, and really there isn't a whole lot of hugely navigable rivers in the Twilight Peaks to begin with. There no. are streams and, and smaller rivers and so forth, but there is nothing at all on the scale of the Serpent River or even some of the lesser Serpent tributaries. You know, you're looking at canoes as probably what you're best going to be dealing with. And again, as you said, working upstream yeah. a lot of the time and then needing to probably frequently portage, that is, get out and carry your canoe and all of your gear around rapids or up cliffs or whatever, really water travel is not likely to be something that is particularly effective unless you've got pretty significant magic to help you out in some regards. Just wanted to make sure we covered all bases. Yeah. <laughs> As a quick sidebar sort of relating to that, there have been plenty of resources that have been published in RPGdom over the past umpteen years talking about wilderness expeditions and various things like that, in addition to sort of the hazards that you might face, but how things like that might go on. Like, for example, the old uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Wilderness Survival Guide, to go back quite a way, has a bunch of information about gamifying some aspects of that. If you are going to be running a game that is dealing with any kind of overland expedition in the Twilight Peaks, uh, whether going by foot or whatnot, that may be a time where you would want to potentially look at the survival, the wilderness survival rules. If the group has not sufficiently prepared, or even if to a certain extent they have, you know, you might want to deal with wilderness survival a bit more directly navigation um, so that they cannot get lost, um, end up down a blind canyon. There are a lot of potential disasters that could befall a group that is hiking around. Look into documentaries of people that are doing climbs or expeditions on K2. peaks like Everest or K2 or or um, Kilimanjaro, although yeah. that one's not quite as bad or requires quite as much. But, you know, there's a lot of real world sort of documentary information that's available out there now to help make your group's expedition. Yeah. How, how to make the, the mountaineering even more authentic to a certain extent, if that is something yeah. that you want to have be a part of the game. Not everybody is into that. It depends in part on why your group is going there. If they are going there to perhaps strike deals with a moot, uh, whether as part of a alliance gathering kind of thing in a pre-Second War game or stuff along those lines, um, you might want to downplay the overall so-called hex crawl style of needing to find their way to where they're going and just maybe have an encounter or two 
that will sort of highlight the hazards of the area without requiring a whole bunch of wilderness survival roles and making sure they have enough food and water and stuff like that. Again, it all depends on the style of game and story that you're running, but that is an area where those sorts of things might be a little bit more interesting to bring into play. Totally. So let's say you've handled all that. You've passed the dangerous creatures. You're going to go meet the crystal raiders on good terms. What are you going to do for food and shelter? Again, we're going to get bogged down in the minutiae here because it's fun to do. Sometimes we're exploring crystal raider culture and how they live. So most primarily for the crystal raiders, their diet is mainly meat, cheese, and bread. We are talking mountain goats, otherwise known as bighorn sheep, or colloquially in Colorado, it's they're called rams. <laughs> you know, the ones that butt, up, butt heads on the top of mountains. Uh, so this is where the meat comes from. The milk is turned into cheese, and this is where yep. the, the skins that they wear. So you can tell, take a look at that. Since ancient Barsave is modern-day Ukraine... So if you want some examples, I took a look at the mountainous area in Ukraine. Go look at goat antelopes, Rupikapra, R-U-P-I-C-A-P-R-A, chamois, C-H-A-M-O-I-S, roe deer, R-O-E, deer, the Eurasian lynx, or wild boars. All of those live currently in the mountains in Ukraine. So since that's where Earth Dawn is primarily based... Figured you can go look those up. So basically, meat that they get is boar meat, goat meat, and goat cheese. Now, how do they make bread, you ask? That is something called high-altitude wheat. And living at altitude, a mile above sea level. So we have a product here called Hungarian flour. And they also, the crystal uh, have honey from lowland beehives. And so if you have honey and you like alcohol, you can make mead. Mead, Yes. So, uh, and they also, by the way, have mushrooms and fungi grown in caves. That's the basic menu and diet of your Crystal Raider clans. Yeah. And probably a lot of it, like a lot of the diet and such of areas like that, a lot of it would be prepared and such for longer Mm -hmm. lasting especially if you're going to need to have stuff that's going to outfit an airship raid that might be out for days or or maybe potentially even weeks at a time. So you'll have a lot of that meat, you know, cured into jerky or similar kind of dried goods. You might potentially supplement that with, again, like in the Great Sword Valley or the Great Forest, you would have trees that potentially would be either a uh, nut or fruit bearing to some extent that might be gathered. Yeah. Not farmed, you know, you wouldn't have orchards or anything like that, but you, you know, when you had groups that were going out doing hunting for boar or anything like that might also be foraging for what they could. And again, having that end up being sort of dried or, you know, useful as a supplement. We talked in an earlier episode yeah. about the possibility of, of like, Um, starchy tubers or something like that that also might be able to grow reasonably well in the lower altitudes and and the the soil there. Um, One of the advantages of the Twilight Peaks in one sense is that because of the volcanic activity there, the soil where there is soil is apt to be pretty rich. Yes. Volcanic soil is actually pretty good for growing stuff. And while there isn't necessarily a lot of it you know it's not like hawaii for example or places like that where you do have a lot of rich black sort of volcanic soil it's more like italy in the the shadow of mount vesuvius yeah maybe uh but in the places where you know where soil can accumulate and again in the lower altitudes where you're not dealing with the colder air and and the the more sort of extreme conditions the Great Sword Valley and the the Gray Forest, while they do need to contend with the ash from the volcanic activity in some extent, probably the the soil is pretty rich in yeah. some regards, and it's a matter of limited area and the general aversion of Crystal Raider culture to agriculture in general that prevents them from making better use of that land. Although, again, they probably would forage for 
stuff that that kind of occurs naturally within that area when the opportunity presents itself. And don't forget, that's just what they live on nearby in their immediate area. They also, by the way, pick up things when they're raiding the lowlands. Yes. And those sorts of things would be treats and probably would be featured in a feast or celebration that was held in honor of a successful raid, likely be something that was distributed amongst the 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 members of the raid that took those spoils, maybe with a portion going to the chief or headman of that clan or moot, that sort of situation. The one thing that really is not a concern when it comes to resources in the Twilight Peaks, we kind of address this a little bit in the travel, is water. Because of the high peaks and the snows and whatnot that uh, that do exist at those higher altitudes, there actually is quite a bit of water that is available, broadly speaking, within the Twilight Peaks. Not as much when you get onto the southern slopes and closer to the actual volcanoes, because it all boils away into steam. But water in general is something that is not overly difficult to come by. And so unlike an expedition into, say, the Badlands or the Wastes, where in addition to food, you also need to make sure you're bringing enough water because you can't trust that the water you're going to find there is going to be safe. That is not as much of a concern when it comes to the Twilight Peaks. Fair. So to your point, uh, during those whole spoils of whatever they raided and got back, main meals for most of the Troll crystal raiders are at early evening, and leftovers from that meal are served at breakfast and lunch the next day. And so they take most of the day, because again, you're talking about boar meat and or uh, bighorn sheep. Those are going to be tough cuts of meat. So they're going to need to stew for a while or braise for a while or just take a while to break down. Long, slow cooking. Yes. The leftover, so therefore that's prepared all day for the fresh meal at dinner time supper time, early evening, and any leftovers, of course, reheated or enjoyed, <laughs> take your pick, uh, for breakfast or lunch the night, whatever you've got. Um, so most Crystal Raider troll homes, this is the visual part of me that needs to know what things look like that I'm describing for my players. Most troll homes there are long, single-story buildings. They usually have a huge hearth and fireplace with an iron cauldron in that fireplace. And over the hearth, is usually the clan shield and or a trophy or clan symbol. So reminds me of the Vikings. Yes, that was I was going to say, if you're looking for imagery, look up images of longhouses. Uh, The Vikings lived in longhouses. There were a few native cultures in the U.S. that also lived in longhouse style dwellings. And so that is something that you could look to for inspiration in how the troll architecture could be designed. Viewed. Yeah, that's a good word. Couldn't think of the word architecture. So onto the family, since we're kind of narrowing down broad, broad view of the mountains, broad view of the, of the clans, let's get down to the actual families and clans themselves. So as we all know, the troll clan is the central unit of crystal Raider family structure. It's essentially a large extended family. And I'm going to throw out a word, so Josh, disagree with me if you want to. This is kind of like polygamy. Am I wrong? Yes, you are not wrong. The troll clans practice line marriage, which is a form of polygamy. It is not polygamy in the way that I think popularly pops to mind in the U.S., like pop culture. When people in the U.S. think of polygamy, it often gets tied into one husband, many wives. And that is not really the case with troll clan, Highland troll line marriage. In that case, it is it is not just one husband and then all of their wives. There are multiple members of the marriage, quote unquote, from both genders. To a certain extent, all of the members of that marriage have a certain amount of say who is allowed, who gets invited into that line marriage. It is something that if you are interested in looking more into that, looking into some present day discussions of the the sort of popular term these days is polycules. It, It is a polygamous relationship where you've got 
potentially multiple partners and not everybody is necessarily a partner of everybody else, but that there are multiple relationships within that. And it is something that to a certain extent is a little bit more away from the popular perception of yeah. polygamy when it comes to that sort of thing. Fair. No, I figured to describe line marriage in trollic context, it's more than two participants, as Josh said. All of them have equal status. The elder members either have or get more respect or deference because they are the elders. Because that's the troll culture. Elder means something. They've lived this long. Darn it. And it is shameful for that clan to take on more partners than the clan can provide for. So the clan cannot expand beyond their means. But the cr troll crystal raiders and the highland trolls used to be used to be monogamous before the Arakalcum Wars wiped out families. And so they're doing this as a matter of survival so that some of the, the clan names can survive. But yes, they take on men, women, and so forth and so on, and they occasionally trade partners, but whatever. It's more or less to just keep the clan and thriving more than just, you know, they look cute. Let's bring them in. That ain't going to happen. That's not what the th that's that's there for. Yeah, there is a certain amount, especially in the higher status families, there is a certain amount of political maneuvering or desirability when it comes to who gets invited to join the line marriage. But yeah, it is a, a case of is to think of it more as an extended family. It, it does not follow the Western generational yeah. idea where you have like the parents and, and the children and the nuclear family concept that we have in, a lot these days. It's not even to the extent of the Dwarves of Thrall, which we haven't really talked about in a great extent, but how that would be a multi-generational household, but it's still grandparents, kids, grandchildren, yeah. maybe great-grandparents, possibly aunts and uncles. This is a slightly different kind of structure to the broader family unit, and it is one that is mm -hmm. communal to a large extent, um, where the entire household shares responsibilities and there's actually a similarity in in some ways to though not quite the same but there i see some similarities yeah. to to scrying culture in terms of how they are communal although in a little bit of a different way in the sense of like the the larger extended family yeah it's a similar kind of thing for for the example i can i can i kind of gleaned from the book here so basically, let's, let's, let's just think of an example line marriage. There's 10 to 12 partners, male and female, whatever mix you want, seven and five, six and six, doesn't really matter. They all are the elders. They all are partners to some extent. Maybe not every single one of them, partner to every single other one of them. But all the children born of those unions and all the adult siblings in this line marriage uh, and all the adults, all of that, all of those members are the clan. Nice encapsulation, you think? Yeah, I think that that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. And then in a community, you might have three or four clans. A smaller village or whatever might only have one or two. Larger communities might have as many as eight or ten or whatever. If you're considering that when you, f when you start factoring in children and all that sort of thing you're looking at a at a clan having potentially several dozen members and so that is something to to sort of keep in mind and the size of the community would determine to a certain extent how large or how many clans are present there but when you start dealing with not only like the line marriages of one group, but then you get their children who might end up in line marriages of their own, you can have like this kind of really complex sort of family tree of relationships that really can potentially expand the clan in terms of how many members there are. And then you get multiple clans yeah. within a region all forming together and through the cross relationships that develop as a result of line marriages where individuals from one village will go to another and join a marriage over there and whatnot. 
that's the extent those building blocks end up forming the overall moot. Um, and so a moot will have probably yeah. quite a number of clans broken up and spread across different villages and whatnot. That's the kind of situation there is that it ends up being this really kind of complex web of relationships that exists as opposed to the more traditional concept of a family tree where you've got these like descending lines. It's it's more there's a lot more like interconnected lattice. Yeah, it's it's a lot more sort of interconnected lattice. It's a constant Y down to one person. Fractal. It, 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 it's a fractal kind of situation almost. Yeah, no, I was going to say that in in its own way presents a potential for politics and drama and relationships and soap opera, to, for lack of a better term, where you've got these broad extended families. Um, if you kind of think of drawing inspiration from like Southern Gothic fiction, where you have these sprawling extended families and the relationships and the history. Yeah. Going back, you look at the small towns that Stephen King talks about in some of his books and how you've got these families that have been there for generations and the longstanding relationships and whatnot that can come up there. Uh, the Appalachians have a long kind of tradition of, of generations of a family kind of all growing up and maintaining in the same area. Um, yeah. A lot of sort of rural communities have that sort of thing going on. And then, of course, you could look at the Vikings, the TV show. Um, has some similar kind of stuff that's going on with that. I mean, that's kind of like a gimme in terms of obvious inspirations, but uh, that is another place where you could draw that sort of thing. But just the idea of multiple generations and the feuds yes. and relationships and alliances and and everything that can kind of develop as a result of this isolated society that is well fiercely proud and struggling to make a living in some regards, there's a lot of stuff that you can draw inspiration from in that sense. Oh yeah. And we'll come back to the Vikings TV show more time because uh, we can. So the roles that everybody plays in this line marriage, the wives control the line marriage and partner selection and courting of new partners. The men get no say in this. If they object, they can make their objection, but if they if they feel that strongly about it, they can divorce the clan and then leave. That's it. Women are in charge of the whole, of the whole clan. I'm going to say that. They can't be in charge of the clan as far as being the chief, but the eldest wife is known as the first wife, not necessarily the first married. This also could cause some issues. If, the, if you bring somebody into the line marriage who's finally an elder wife, she's now the first wife because she's the oldest. Not the longest married, but the oldest. That might cause some tension. Who knows? Just saying. And that's Earth on for you. It's all about the drama. Uh, but the eldest wife also has the most influence on the clan chief and any of the warriors therein. The clan chief, by the way, leads the raids, makes agreements, and is responsible for all members of the clan, and is judge when disputes arise if there's no quester of Minbruge around. Yeah. It's really interesting how... In this kind of situation, and what's described here in this is that the lifestyle and culture of these people is presented, and then the the consequences of how that environment and how that lifestyle and those traditions themselves help shape the traditions and the, the culture that develops around those people, how there is kind of like a back and forth the idea that there is still, in one sense, as a warrior culture, as a raiding culture, there's a strong sort of masculine, patriarchal kind of society there where you've got the clan chief who is in charge and responsible for the well-being of the entire clan. But that there is also a very strong representation because the chief and the warriors and those sort of experienced yeah. adult males are potentially going to be away from the clan for ta for a time on a raid or whatever, that then the responsibility for the hearth and the well-being and the health of the community falls to yes. those who are left behind. I think there are enough examples 
of characters that are presented in this book. We've talked about a few of them over the past several episodes about this, where there are notable warriors and sky raiders and whatnot who are female. I don't think that while broadly the Highlands troll culture is kind of a masculine patriarchal type of society, they respect strength. And if a female troll is strong and able to hold her own in a raid and to acquit herself with honor, she is given just as much respect as any other. Yeah. I don't get the sense that it's a misogynist culture. It's just one that is no. sort of traditionally masculine in a sense without the nastier shit that can go along with that. Exactly. Well, it's like kind of like the shield maidens in Vikings, again, the TV show, uh, as I said, we come back to that. It's like the shield maidens are absolutely completely respected everything that they do. And, you know, we can go on forever about that TV show. Anyway, so uh, the last two things to notice about living in troll culture, you may occasionally may come across new watts. Oh, boy. And this is a direct troll word for life debt. So Nuwats are captured name givers, even lowland trolls, uh, who are made into servants. Now, the distinction, they are not slaves in the extent. Okay. Well, they're not bought and sold. They do receive the same food and yeah. they can earn back their freedom. That's the parsing of words delineation about, about what they are. Yeah. There are some mighty fine slices. Oh, we're splitting hairs now that are split with that. There are definitely those in the Earth Dawn fan community who view the Crystal Raiders as the greatest of hypocrites. Fair. That they practice the very thing that they, to a certain extent, hate the Therans yes. for. And that's not quite the case as it is with, say, the, the Orcs. Right. The orcs have a much stronger cultural aversion to slavery. Oh, yeah. The Karads of, of Karafad and the orcish diaspora in Barsav have a generally much stronger cultural aversion to that. And there is certainly some validity that can be seen with the argument that the trolls are splitting hairs or playing word games in a sense that, you know, we don't have slaves, we have nuance and we treat yeah. them well. I can completely understand how you could take that as a negative. I would imagine given the honor that is sort of central to Crystal Raider culture and coupled with that, the idea that the chief, the head of the clan has a responsibility to care for the clan and that somebody should not be going hungry if the chief is well fed, that there are certainly clans within the Crystal Raiders, and there can be a variety of approaches on this, but that there are clans who actually treat their nuance yeah. with respect yeah. because to not do so would be an affront to the honor of the clan. Mm hmm. And similar to how, like, a line marriage should not be expanded beyond what the clan can support, having Nuwats in, in a way could be seen amongst the clans as a sign of their wealth, for lack of a yeah. better term, of their ability to provide for a larger community. We are so successful in our rating that we are able to support members of our community who are not part of the clan. And again, I'm not condoning necessarily this. I'm just offering some various takes. And you could just as easily have clans where the nuance are not treated with particular respect, that they are not subject to the same requirements of honor mm -hmm. that actual members of the clan awesome. would be. That is something that you could use as an indication of how the clan is from a potentially moral storytelling standpoint. Broadly speaking, you can say how good a society is, is based on how they treat the lowest members of their community, you know, the, the, the marginalized, the lesser. And so that is definitely something that you could 
have in mind there. Um, the novel Mother Speaks has a significant portion in it where the main character, the, the POV character, and several others are all nuots as part of a troll clan and the situation there. And there is, in a sense, and this is sort of, I think, the final thing we're going to talk about tonight, that nuots do have potentially the ability to earn their quote unquote freedom or to earn themselves an actual place within the clan. Exactly. Because any domestic abuse by the raider who took them is a shame on the clan, is a shame on the raider, especially. Uh, and so, yes, but they can lead at any time by the raider who took them. And sometimes if you actually save the raider's life who took you, if you're a new bot. Anyway, when that happens, when you are freed, the Noag Rall can be a non-troll name giver member of the raider clan. Because somebody wrote in a couple of weeks ago with an email uh, they had this whole thing, this whole storyline built up about the uh, Noagarol, and the Noagarol can be in the line marriage or a Nuat getting membership into the clan because they've been freed and if they choose to join the clan because they f like it there or whatever, they can decide to stay and be a contributing member with equal standing. And that's the thing. The Noagarol has, has equal standing to any troll clan member in every way based upon honor and reputation. The same as any other full troll member of that community would be. Uh, an interesting kind of tidbit at the end of the section on the uh, Noah Garal is that quite often, because when a new Watt gains their freedom, they do not have to achieve this status. They are free to leave the, the Twilight Peaks if they wish and return to the lowlands or wherever it is that they wish to go. But those who do stay behind and adopt troll ways, which is essentially what's happening here, can become even more traditional and hidebound than the trolls themselves because of a need to embrace that and prove themselves becoming sort of more troll than trolls in a sense. There is certainly a possibility, especially when interacting with trolls outside of their clan or moot, that they might be initially seen as lesser. You know, they might be approached in a more negative way and that they need to prove that they are deserving of that place that they have earned. And that is something that can be very important to someone who has climbed up to that position. Agreed. So that's part one of how, what it's like to live in the Crystal Raiders culture for this episode. Uh, that covers us to about an hour or so. If you have any questions about what you heard tonight, please feel free to email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, folks, go join the Crystal Raider clan for your legend. Good night, everybody. Good night.